welcome everyone to this session on robot reporting, are the journalists an endangered species? Now, just before we started the session, we ran a very informal audience poll, and the general consensus was that most people on balance felt that journalists were not an endangered species. So it's going to be very interesting to see how we feel by the end of this session. So to start off, I'd like to um, first of all introduce myself. My name is Ingrid Silva. I'm a partner at Reed Smith. Reed Smith is an international law firm and I specialize in digital media. And today we have a really fantastic panel with phenomenal experience of AI and I think it's quite rare to bring together such a degree of expertise with a topic that is still so new and cutting edge. So what I'd like to do to start with is ask our panelists to very briefly introduce themselves, uh, the organization that they're involved in and, and their contact with um, or exposure to, um, to AI and robotics. So Ali, could we start with you, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Ali Shah, Head of Emerging Technology and Strategic Direction at the BBC. Um, my role is really looking at how emerging technologies can be used to really transform what the BBC does in the interests of its audiences. And my particular passion and my focus at the moment is around helping the BBC build its machine learning capability, both technically, but also in its human capacity, its people. So how do you balance both those things? Thank you. Rainer, tell us about your world. Morning, everybody. My name is Rainer Kellerhals. I'm Microsoft's media and entertainment industry lead for EMEA. In my role, I'm working with our largest customers, including Al Jazeera, on applying artificial intelligence along the entire media value chain. And we're also providing feedback as an industry team inside Microsoft to our engineering groups, what are the requirements of the media industry with regards to artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence will not replace journalists, but it will actually augment and complement human creativity and ingenuity. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Yasser Bisher. I uh, manage the digital operations uh, for uh, digital, uh, including uh, um, bringing new technologies and improving our current operations. The goal is really to expand the digital footprint for Al Jazeera. And my specific expertise in AI is actually my PhD was on a specific uh, sector of AI, which is semantics and semiotics and knowledge representation. Thank you. And I'm uh, Ahmed Al Magarmid. I am the executive director of the Qatar Computing Research Institute. I'm a computer scientist by training, and my specialty is in uh, database systems, data curation, and data quality. Fantastic. So, as you've heard, we have a panel that represents uh, broadcasters, BBC and Al Jazeera. Uh, we have Microsoft, which is at the cutting edge of really innovation and deployment of solutions. And we have, I don't want to say academia, because you're That's so closely academia. involved with business, but really at the cutting edge. In fact, we have two PhDs on the panel, so it doesn't get better than this. Um, so we're going to explore some very complex issues today. and. Often when I'm involved in these sorts of discussions, I have a pretty clear idea at the outset of, of how the discussion is going to go. But actually today, I'm really not sure at all. And, and I shared this with the panelists earlier on, and they said to me, no, 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 that's absolutely normal. This is AI. You don't know where it's going to go. So we're all just going to go with it and embrace this discussion and find out where it's going to take us. Wherever it takes us, it's going to be fascinating. But before we start exploring what the future holds. I'd like to start with the present and what AI means in concrete terms today. Um, so some of you may have been at uh, Ali's keynote earlier on, and in a little while I might ask Ali to just recap on some of the practical applications that the BBC has been deploying. But before we do that, Rainer, you, you have exposure to the deployment of these sorts of solutions across a whole range of organizations, environments, uh, nationalities, and, and cultures. C could you share with us some of the, the concrete applications of AI that you're seeing in, in your role? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And as uh, Shaw said, it's really along the entire media value chain. So let, let me start with maybe uh, research. So if journalists need to find a certain piece of content, 
uh, specifically in video, it can be, as we heard this morning, very time consuming to find that snippet uh, that you actually would be interested in. So automated video indexing, uh, extracting metadata from video like a transcript, like recognizing speakers, recognizing objects, actions, brands, sentiment, keywords, all these kinds of things uh, can be automated with artificial intelligence today, making it easier for humans to find the scene or the shot that they are looking for, for reuse in maybe another production. So that is one of the areas which is already, I would say, uh, starting to mature and where we are seeing quite a few real world, uh, re real world applications. Another example is when the uh, um, you know, Panama Papers were released or when the JFK files were released about the JFK assassination. We are talking about document sets of more than 100,000 pages of documents that would be very hard to read through for any journalist. Again, this is where artificial intelligence can help. Um, to be have a service that is called an entity linking service. So what we're basically doing here is <clears throat> we're doing OCR on the uh, scanned pages in order to convert the paper documents into uh, computer readable text. Then from that computer readable text, we extract keywords, key concepts, and then we create basically a semantic web of how these are related to each other. And that helps journalists to navigate that universe of documents and relatively quickly find, you know, which persons are connected to which other persons, which persons are connected to which locations, and to which topics that are being discussed in the papers. So in the case of the JFK files, that made it possible for journalists who used our, our software to, within a few hours, basically, understand what is the new content in the JFK files that were, were released. So, so this is just two examples. automation of a task that would previously have been carried out by a human being, but in a much faster, efficient way, Right, yeah, I way, wouldn't would necessarily call it, um, it, it, it's a way of automating, that's mm -hmm. right, but it's still, you know, as I said uh, in, in the intro, it's assisting uh, journalists rather than replacing any work they are, do, okay. they are doing. Let me give you maybe two more examples. Uh, one is in the content creation process. So the Associated Press, for instance, um, have a team of uh, reporters who are writing reports about uh, quarterly earnings releases of uh, um, uh, companies traded in the U.S. stock market. Uh, and historically, they've done that completely manually. Uh, so they could, about, they could write about 300 of those earnings reports every quarter, covering about 300 companies. A little while ago, they introduced uh, software to, uh, to automate the pro that process to at least uh, create, create a basic version of a quarterly earnings reports with all the facts in there. So what that software basically does, it takes the data feed, uh, it uses a template uh, and a certain uh, language style, and then uh, automatically creates a quarterly earnings report. And what the journalists then do, they just add additional insight to those basic reports. So they can focus on adding value and adding contextual insight and linking that information to, for instance, why did the revenue re decrease in that company or why did that company post uh, a loss in the last quarter? So they can add that insight rather than doing the legwork of pulling together the data and you know, writing the basics like revenue decreased by 15% compared to the last quarter, which is sometime something a, a robot journalist can, can easily do. Mm -hmm. And then to kind of move to the end of the value chain, uh, we've worked with uh, Reuters and uh, my colleague uh, uh, Yusuf Khalidi showed that, that yesterday in his, uh, in his keynote. Um, Reuters is using one of our services, it's called the Custom Decision, Decision Service, to understand uh, which types of videos are most relevant for certain audiences. So this is a little bit like a recommendations engine, mm -hmm. and that personalizes the uh, media experience for the, for the user of the Reuters uh, news service. So this is three or four examples for how artificial intelligence is, is being used in journalism today. Right, so, so it's really about automation and efficiency of tasks, information collation, mm -hmm. but perhaps not the, the subjective, uh, let, let's call it spin for want of a better word, mm -hmm. on that information. And, um, and then recommendation, which is quite interesting as well because that's correlating the underlying data with, um, with the audience, if you like, perception or receiving of that data. So that's the extension of that. So Ali, having heard those examples, is, is the, BBC, the BBC you shared with us earlier is doing similar 
things to that. But do you feel the BBC is doing something beyond those activities of automation, compilation, recommendation at the moment, or are they the core areas of activity? I, I think we would build on what Rain has just said by adding that we're in all of those examples also really conscious and exploring and innovating around what is the balance between editorial control and and technical control and, and editorial agency versus technical agency and they have to go hand in hand uh, and the reason I say that and um, I didn't get a chance to cover in my keynote is that the one thing that media organizations like the BBC Al Jazeera and others have is we have a huge depth of expertise in journalism in anthropology political science data science the range of roles that make up a modern media organization mm -hmm. is the next frontier of development in AI. So you're starting to see a lot of the technology companies really recruiting those skills in. It's just that we already have it. So what we're trying to do is combine those two things. That's the first thing. So, sorry, I, so editorial mm -hmm. control and the interface between, let's call it AI, that grouping of activities, is the bit where you feel that the BBC is really pushing boundaries and, and testing things at the moment. And I want to come right. back to that notion of editorial control and responsibility later on. But sorry, carry on. But, but the second thing is just understanding the realities of use cases. So extracting information from text or detecting objects in video, um, it's almost a commodity now. Lots of providers can do it. Some do it better than others. And you know, that Microsoft, um, Google, Amazon, some startups have great capability in this area, um, undoubtedly. But uh, detecting a van in a video or a cat or a dog, um, how useful is that in your editorial day-to-day -day workflows? And often what we find is being 80% good enough is not good enough. Actually, to make it practically useful for journalists and content creators, getting up to accuracy much higher than that is really important. But then really starting to add context to what's in the scene. So simply detecting an object doesn't add the value that you need. Giving the context around what's going on is really what journalists are searching against or really considering. So that's an unexplored territory. People are just starting to take steps towards Contextualization. adding some meaning. Yeah, adding meaning right. to, to Interesting. The... Now, Dr. Ahmed, I know you have very strong, insi interesting insights and views on, on data, which I'd like to bring you in on in a moment. But just before we do that, Yasser, yeah, so tell us a bit about what Al Jazeera is doing in this space. Did, is what you've heard so far consistent with what you're involved in? Yeah. So. We have really internal discussions about um, AI, as I was discussing with Ali earlier this morning. We, we're not really in a hurry in using uh, AI right now, and there are a few reasons for that. Let's go to the basics. So AI has two parts. One is the algorithm itself, and there are really a hand, handful of them. There are not two thousands of algorithms, just a handful of algorithms. And then there is the data that you use to train the algorithms uh, for the machines to make certain decisions. Uh, these data are generated by humans, and uh, you know, so there is an inherent bias in the data that you use to train the algorithm. So that the end result of the machine will have some certain bias inherent in the, in, you know, coming from the data itself. So when we see, when we, when we look at this machine that has the data and the algorithm, and the result is a trained machine to do some certain task related, for example, to uh, to making the job of the journalist more efficient, for example, searching like the example that has been brought before, there is a danger of the filter bubble that will be, uh, that the journalist will be exposed to, right? Because you will be using AI to recommend for you and give you some content that the machine believes is relevant to the context of the journal, uh, of the journalist or, or the search that the journalist is conducting to really write about a certain topic. So there is, a, there is a danger to that, that that you also have to be aware of and really analyze from a, a practical point of view, from a journalistic point of view, not technical, not engineering, but really from a journalistic point of view. Does it make sense to put a journalist or a newsroom in a filter bubble managed by an, in a, an automated a machine? manner? The second is uh, application that is currently could be done, which is discussed before, is the applications that are facing the audience, like, you know, uh, recommending certain articles to, uh, to related to current article and managing the comments and all that. And I think applying that is a lot easier than touching the workflow of journalists. So I think for, from our perspective, it's better for us to really look into, uh, and, and we're talking to Google actually in, in using some of this, their technologies in moderating the comments section in articles. 
uh, you know, recommending certain article, bearing in mind uh, that all the process of mo uh, recommending articles to audience should not be automated. Some editorial control need to be. Uh, so if I understand out. correctly, what, what you're saying is in the context of generating news and information, th there is some degree of potential bias Definitely. in the it's data input the data. because it is dependent on human input and that poses certain risks, yeah. whereas interfacing with the recipients yes. of news is a m much more, s relatively speaking, straightforward Though use not, of AI because of, sorry, I can't right, should, yeah, it, it should not be fully automated. There need to be right. some editorial interference. But there's greater scope. That's right. Interesting. Can I just... Ahmed, can, sorry, can Ali, go ahead. Just point really quickly. I think two points that you made that um, really challenged me. The first one, choosing your pace is really important. I'm not getting dragged by the wider industry into areas you don't want to go, unless you've really explored it yourself, is really important. And so we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that our data is our strength and our understanding, our people are our strength. So that's leverage in really exploring this territory. I fully agree with that. I think on the second one, the sorts of challenges that are going to emerge, well, they're unmapped at the moment. And that's why having that joint um, engagement with editorial is so important because it's really important not to just close the doors just because those issues are unmapped and say, we're not going to try. It's really important to try, to take small steps, but do that in concert with the wider organization to explore, okay, well, if we are offering search capability in our newsrooms, or if we are starting to offer, offer audience-facing experiences, what are the sorts of things we need to consider and think about to avoid some of the pitfalls we've seen appear in other industries, right? right. So, some so, so don't have pitfalls. AI for its own sake, but don't no. shut the door on it either, but rather consciously embrace it with an awareness There's of, huge of what positive you're choosing potential. to do. Right. Huge positive potential. Sorry, Ali, I'm going to cut yeah. you off there because I think we absolutely need to bring Ahmed into this yeah. discussion. It we've heard, good. yeah, it's going <laughs> it well. good. It's going well. but we've heard that data is potentially subject to bias because of the human input. Ali's just said that data is the greatest asset. You're a data specialist. T tell us what you're thinking as you, you hear these views expressed. So let me spice things up a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, let me bring this into terms that uh, will bring the audience in. You remember the discussion about uh, unknown knowns and unknown unknowns? Mm -hmm. Traditional algorithms look into things that, we, that are known, but we don't know them, and using traditional um, algorithms, uh, uh, we would go about finding this information from a deluge of data. What machine learning gives us an additional power that is looking at the unknown unknowns, things that we didn't know that we didn't know. So by looking at tremendous amount of data, we could, using machine learning algorithms, discover things that we didn't even know was there. So uh, let me bring this into context. Um, the master of ceremonies this morning, Rawa, asked, um, it would be nice if we could um, um, do video editing in the sense that I want to be able to identify, find a video from an archive in seconds. Well, that is already doable. Could I, for example, identify the sentiment? Could I, could I let's spice things up a little bit. Could I say, I want to find video of a child who's crying or of a child who's injured? Could I find the video, you know, where I am not even, I don't even know what I'm looking for? Those things are doable uh, using uh, today's technology. So, um, this is some of the things that uh, we work on in the Qatar Computing Research Institute. And by the way, it's a part of Hamad bin Khalifa University in Education City. And, and some of the things that we work on in machine learning in the context of social computing, machine learning in the context of uh, language technologies, transcription, for example, translation, all of these things use machine learning algorithms. And yes, uh, data, needs to be trained, and the danger that, that I see is that um, uh, the problem is fairly complex, and, and there are a lot of nuances into how you train the algorithm, how you sample the data, and so on, so we, lest we are too hasty, we have to be uh, 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 careful. Mm -hmm. so
in a way, the, the human intervention at the outset in devising what the capability will be and the potential output is critical. And if that human input at the beginning isn't appropriate, then everything else gets skewed from there. Yes. But also after that, like a good example is in 2016, Microsoft, Microsoft, uh, they, they put out a, a Twitter bot called Tay. And um, that, it was very smart that, the, so they, they trained Tay before putting it out, but then it was, it had like continuous learning, right? From, from the interaction with the audience, uh, with, the, with the users, it became, it became uh, you know, more experienced in responding to tweet. So as anyone who works in AI, there's an objective function, the goal of, the, of Tay is to become popular. And quickly enough, within 16 hours only, uh, the bot learned how to be more controversial. To be popular, it have to be controversial. So it started talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, really more expletive, explicit, expletive terms, you know, more anti-Semite, and a lot. That was a feedback. That that was the learning coming from the actual users of the bot. That Microsoft put it down after 16 hours. So the lesson learned from there is, even if you have a machine that you put all the you know, all the, the stops to make sure that it is not biased, even though it will be biased. Um, the actual learning process that happened during the operation will make it also biased toward, you know, uh, coming from the data during the actual use. So the risk is not only during the preparation of the machine, but also during the execution of the machine. How that is gonna be managed, uh, I don't think there's an answer for that right now. And, and by the way, if I may, sure. uh, so th this is um, a very interesting, you know, we, we've been comparing uh, over the last two days between traditional media versus uh, modern, you know, social media and so on and so forth. And, and, and obviously, I mean, there is no question that the two are coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, all news agencies now are technology based. I mean, it's just, uh, and, and um, 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 so, the traditional media has to be more smart into all of these things that uh, Yasser just mentioned. That is creating uh, bubbles, uh, creating these filters that would uh, tunnel the vision of uh, people who go through the news. But now imagine if the newsmaker develops that tunnel and, uh, and these uh, biases because of these filters. So, I mean, th th there is just, there is no more discussion about traditional media versus uh, digital media. The two are together, the two are one anymore. So that segues nicely into, into the discussion that Ali started a few minutes ago, I think, because what we can take away from this initial discussion is that the input and how you handle the data at the outset is critical, but then what happens subsequently is also potentially subject to bias and influence, and, and that's where the, the, I don't know if it's a human intervention, but certainly an editorial intervention comes into play. So Ali, hearing that sort of comment and context, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I, again, I'm struck um, and agree with uh, Raina and, and the rest of the panel that this, there's a long way to go on some of these tools and techniques. You can't preemptively judge every single outcome. In fact, we're on uh, the AI journey is all about us realizing that more agency is going to be given to the algorithms as they mature and become and, more sophisticated. Sorry, I'm just going to stop you there because agency is a, is a term that's been popping up a lot, but I wonder if we could just explain for the audience benefit what we mean by agency. One way of, of thinking about it is the degree of control over some of the decision making based on the input that's given. So the to intervention it. Yeah. through the process yeah. by a human. Or, or, or through the algorithm. So if you are providing lots of data to um, an algorithm, you're running an algorithm on lots of your data, we are moving to a world where we were able as engineers to codify all of the range of possible answers to a problem and run the computer code and we would out would pop one of the answers depending on the input conditions. Actually, the power of machine learning and the development of AI is that you don't have to do that anymore. A lot of the latest techniques don't really require you to code in all of the possible solutions. You're exploring what's going on and, and a lot of the techniques are helping you do that. But as these systems become more sophisticated and as multiple systems interplay with each other, 
understanding where a decision is being made becomes much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So alongside, there's been lots of discussion about bias. Alongside bias, I think there's a couple of things that are really important. Having transparency about not only where you're using an algorithm, but how the algorithm is working is really important. What went into its development so that you understand the logic behind how it was constructed. Making sure that in that moment you then have a, a degree of understanding about accountability. Where will those accountable decision points manifest themselves? How will you be able to interrogate that ecosystem? These things need to come together. But back to the point about the editorial is, bias, transparency, accountability, these sorts of terms are not new to media. You know, we are used to dealing with these sorts of issues. So there's a lot of inherent latent experience in our organizations that we just need to tap into so that we don't end up in situations where the unintended consequences of deploying these services comes back to bite us. Now, you can't insulate against all of that. So the real job should be you know, iterate, try, take small steps, iterate, learn, evolve, and reflect, consistently reflect on what is actually happening as you start to scale out your operations. So, so hearing you talk about those notions of accountability, transparency, editorial control, in, in the traditional, traditional media world that we all operate in at the moment, we, we have pretty good cl clarity about how those concepts are implemented in practice because companies have codes of conduct, but more importantly, and putting my lawyer's hat on now, we have rules and regulations and we have regulators. So if those concepts, as you suggest, remain relevant and perhaps even more important in this unknown, unknown world, that we're entering, how do we, in, in practice, enforce those concepts? Or is enforcement the wrong way to, to look at this? What, what are your thoughts on that? So Just a small question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a big question, actually. Big question. Uh, of course, I would like to make a quick comment on, on your example about our, our uh, very uh, un unfortunate experiment with the bot. Um, I think what we learned from that is that if you try to create um, artificial intelligence um, with a certain goal, in that case to attract followership, uh, it might go off in a direction that you have not foreseen and have not intended. Um, and you know, because we have made artificial intelligence a high priority for our product development and for our investments, we are also thinking about what should be the ethics around that and what should be our guiding principles for artificial intelligence. And one of those guiding principles, as I said initially, would be that it shouldn't have kind of a life of its own, its own purposes, but it should always in some way enhance, augment, support human creativity or human decision making, rather than so leaving it entirely to the machine. And if we leave it to the machine, as we might want to do in some cases, when it's, you know, a, a collision prevention system in a car, so, for so instance. So from your point of view, sorry, yeah. carry on. For a car, for instance, you were saying. But I think what you're saying is there is only ever a place for AI and roboticization and so on as a support to human activity yeah. and decision making. Is that what you're suggesting? That, that would be our, our, our point of view. This is what AI should be. That will be our focus around AI. Interesting. But unfortunately, this is, uh, we're already beyond that point. So the, the more uh, machines get designed based on artificial intelligence and machine learning, the more autonomous these machines are made, the more they would have to be responsible for their own decisions. So a car that is an, an autonomous car that's driving doesn't have a, that machine doesn't have a license. So the question is now, if it gets into an accident, Who's who liable? is responsible? So this is, and, and eventually we have to get to a point, and I believe maybe, maybe not in our lifetime, but soon, um, is the artificial intelligence, those autonomous machines, will have to be given an, an entity, an identity, where they would be responsible as much as you and I are. So that, that driverless car will have a legal personality, like a Something company, like and like its own driver's license and insurance policy. Something like that, otherwise you, huh. you couldn't deal with it. Now I'm not talking about singularity. Singularity is much, singularity is much further. Singularity, by the way, just, for those... Just explain that concept yeah, to just the audience. In, in, a, in a nutshell, 
it's where machine intelligence supersedes human intelligence. So let's say this is way, way far, and, and this is science fiction. Put that aside. But in reality, right now, we rely more and more on algorithms that make autonomous decisions. And the more these, these machines, these entities, become more powerful, they'll have to have an identity. How could we deal with them? And, 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 and machines that are making decisions about whether somebody gets hired or not, whether somebody gets a raise or not, right? And, and, and these are algorithms. At some point, if you're going to sue, who you're going to sue? So, okay, so I guess conceptually that there are two potential directions of travel here, and I'm going to test this, this theory with you. So on the one hand, you're suggesting that, let's call it a machine, for want of a better term, will ultimately have its own identity um, and liability Absolutely. and perhaps ability to own property. So we talked about data early on, and I think, Ali, in your earlier presentation, you said data is intellectual property. So it could own property and enforce rights. Fine, that's on one side. Or on the other hand, it will always be owned, ultimately owned and controlled by a human or perhaps a corporate entity, which is an entity we're currently familiar with, who can press the off button if things get out of control. But let me ask you a question. If you go to sue a corporation, who do you sue? You sue the corporation, but at right. the end of the day, there is a person, right? So we're not quite there yet. True. There's and, a director but eventually and a board. We and, will, yep. Yeah, eventually, what I'm saying is eventually, we will have to answer that question. In the short term, not on the long term. Because right now, we have cars driving themselves. Right. You know, on the highway and taxis that are self-driven and so on. So in that world, is there an off button if we don't like what we start to see? Well, I, I think, so depending on what kind of AI we're talking about, even current systems, right? So the, the dilemma in, in autonomous cars is if, if the car is exposed to a situation where, you know, uh, you only have two choices to make, either, you know, hit an old man or hit a child, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how would you make that decision? Uh, and so if the AI is a continuous learning platform, meaning it keeps learning, then who would you sue? That's a big question. But if it's a, an AI platform that is al already been trained and learned and it's just operating uh, based on previous, then you can sue the company. So these are, you know, uh, fundamental questions that are not being, uh, you know, answered, uh, mm -hmm. you know, properly. The same thing, I think Tay is not a failure. I think it's a very, very successful from the perspective. It really kind of opened the door for, for philosophical problems that even engineers have yet to really deal with. Meaning, how can I codify in a programmatic, in an engineering way, ethics, mm -hmm. values? These are concepts that us as human beings understand mm -hmm. and that, that you would need to codify in a Tay version 2.0 that would avoid doing things that it did when it learned, you know, Which specific objectives. Which comes back to an editorial you, you component. You cannot achieve that right now. Now, Ali, you have views on this. Well, I just wanted to come in by saying, understanding how this is all going to develop and, and what the role of regulators or policymakers or governments might be in all this, is still uncharted territory. People are trying to explore it. Different um, countries and, and, and groups are taking slightly different approaches as the technology develops and evolves and it's deployed. But there's three things that you can do today, quite practical things, to get yourself ready for these developments. The first one is, uh, and in the context of the fact that you first need to just set your North Star, what's the direction you're heading in? So in the BBC, we've said, well, we're interested in developing services that are responsible and in the interest of the public, right? So we've said that's our North Star. We want to really support human flourishing and what it means for individuals to have our services. Microsoft have just really talked about, and I welcome this, about really developing services that support, augment, assist individuals. And that's a clear direction. Once you have that, do three things. One is build communities of like-minded individuals and organizations. Get out there, blog, talk, meet. This is a good example of that. There's lots of things you can do very practically just to explore the different dimensions of this. The second one is look at the work that's going on around codifying codes of conduct, ways of working. So Nestor in the UK, the Royal Society, yeah. UK government, House of Laws, lots of organizations are starting to develop practical guidelines for how organizations might want to start to behave and think about these issues that provides you with a framework. In the BBC, we have editorial guidelines, Al Jazeera have a similar thing. Those things provide you with the framework. 
But the final thing is education. Education in two ways. One is internally educating engineers and developers and practitioners about not only the technical skills they need to move the state of the art on, but also the things they need to think about as they're going along. What's the impact going to be on the user that you are developing this algorithm for? Just think about those possible failure modes or the issues that might arise. How will you make how this model works transparent? Even if you can't directly understand the math mathematical model itself, what can you do around it? These practical educational steps are really important. Finally, educating just everyone else, just raising the general level of knowledge around these developments, I think is really important. As we become more aware, we start to understand the different contexts that this can really help us in and be, be used in, but we also then can explore the sorts of challenges it might, it might throw at us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think um, th the flip side of that, and just to sort of build on that point of awareness, in the context of a separate, the internet more widely, there's been an increasing awareness, I guess, of media regulators that there's only so much they can do in practical terms to regulate and the term media literacy has emerged in that end users and viewers have to be educated to navigate their way through content. And perhaps an extension of that is AI literacy, if you like, and education. Now, I just want to open uh, the discussion to the audience because I'm conscious time is ticking on. There is a roving microphone. Do we have any questions from the audience? One over down the front here, please. When you get the microphone, could you please introduce yourself and where you're from before asking your question? Thank you. My name is Tembisa Fukuda. I'm from Al Jazeera Center for Studies. Um, I think what Dr. Ahmed just said is very, very interesting and it scares me after watching the movie by uh, Will Smith called I, Robot, where the humans are, revolt Jarvis, human are revolting against, against the robots. And I think that's what we are most likely to see. Now, the question is, I mean, I hate talking about regulation as a journalist, but I think this discussion following Ali's encouragement for us to have a debate in this matter. We need to have social scientists, engineers, everybody else involved in this discussion because it's, it's a very, very dangerous discussion. I mean, people like uh, Elon Musk, for example, from Tesla, they've already warned us about this arti artificial intelligence, if not regulated, or I'm not talking regulation, but if not carefully managed, curated, curated and managed, it could really lead us into some sort of situations. And some of us are really willing to revolt against these robots if they're going to be replacing us as, as, as humans. So the question is, do you, do you agree with my suggestion that perhaps this discussion should be elevated to a level of United Nations uh, in terms of can we really afford to have this unregulated discussion led by engineers alone and some of us who are not part of the engineering and and, 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 you know, computer science, science, et cetera, not involved in this. I think we all need to be involved because the future belongs to all of us, and if we don't, it's a consequence that we all have to suffer, including our children. So, so the question is, should this discussion be elevated to a pan-national, international uh, realm? Views? I, I think that's already happening, um, but I think it's happening at lots of different levels and strata of society, and that's quite right. You know, down at, I was in San Francisco in January, and my Uber driver was really talking about, well, if more automated uh, driving, uh, driverless cars come in, what it might mean for him. And that was fantastic that he was really talking about that. But it's also happening at the World Economic Forum, happening at levels of government. But it's not just about, okay, let's have a conversation about regulation, that's one dimension, but really about, okay, what can governments and other organizations do to influence and support and, and really create the environment for the development of this, this, this technology in a way that supports human flourishing. That's really the conversation that's happening. What it needs is momentum. We all need to start to really make clear what we think in this space. So in the way that I think I've been quite clear about the BBC, what the BBC thinks and Microsoft have, let's start to state our intent and our positions. What's driving your development? Is it revenue? You know, be, be straightforward about that. Let's not hide behind the fact that lots of companies who are developing these services don't mind that there will be job displacement. They don't, their job is just to sell and return revenue. So for the short sharing. answer is be, yes, but it also has to be a grassroots, be, grassroots effort. Grassroots, but be transparent around motivations and direction that you want to go. Transparency. I, I really think that, that uh, I'm not sure about the UN, but I, I, think, I don't think we're really having a serious conversation about this. I think Elon Musk is absolutely right. And here's... Here's an example that is not really reported well. You know, uh, the Google team, the DeepMind team, has developed the Go 
uh, you know, machine learning algorithm that beat uh, the top guy in, in the Go game. Um, so that was reported widely. What was not reported is the same team came up with a new algorithm. Uh, they call it AlphaGo Zero. That they, what they've done is they just give it the rules of the game and they let the machine teach itself. It played with itself. Didn't get any knowledge from anywhere. They just played with itself. After the, the machine learned and the, how to play uh, the game, it played with that machine that beat the, the, the champion, and it won 100 to zero. So that was not reported. What is the lesson learned from there? What, what, what the paper says is they have the machine, the new, the new machine, applied new methods, very aggressive, that human didn't know before, to win the games. So what I'm saying is, even right now, you're able to create a machine, and also Facebook have created a, a uh, two machine learning that were conversating in, in language that they have developed by itself and they shut down the machines because they were scared from the result. What I'm saying is we are now in an era where you are able to create machines that are able to do things human didn't know how to do before or apply certain strategies that human didn't know before and we're still talking about how to regulate this. I think we are very, very late. The, the situation is pretty dangerous in my, in my view. And so not, we're not waiting for the artificial general intelligence. We are still in the very specific AI, the narrow intelligence, and it's pretty dangerous right now, let alone if we go to AGI, and then we go to the super intelligence. And, and we're not like talking about 100 years. I think AGI is gonna come in the next probably 20, 25 years, we'll begin to see good generations. And a lot of people saying, experts are saying that to go from AGI to super intelligence is not gonna take us probably a couple of days because the machines will be super smart to fix themselves and, and improve themselves to become super intelligence. So it is not like we're talking something 100 years from now. We're talking about 20, 25 years and having a conversation is already should happen yesterday in my view. It's, By uh, the way, uh, I, I just wanna tell you that uh, the cat is out of the box. So yeah. putting things back is not possible. I think regulators, it is a futile business. Uh, uh, things are in motion, but things are continuous. Things are not gonna happen, like Yasser had said, you know, it's gonna take many years. Meanwhile, we have time to adapt to it, and we have time to harness it. I am of the opinion, not of Elon Musk's uh, uh, pessimism, that I actually think that if we look back to the industrial revolution, if you look back at the steam engine, you know, and, and every step of the way of the carriage horse, uh, you know, and, and, and horse carriage and so on, people are always perceived new technology as threatening. But at the end of the day, we've, we were able to exploit it, we were able to take advantage of it and, and, and use it to in betterment of humanity. I believe this is where we will go with this. Uh, singularity, is so far out. So, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I think artificial intelligence is much more powerful than the examples that we've been talking about here. But I just think that things will happen in a continuous fashion that we will figure out how to harness and take advantage of it. At the end of the day, we're not going to have um, uh, no newsrooms, but we will have much more uh, improved, much more efficient, much better, much smarter newsrooms that can control facts, that do automated fact checking and so on and so forth. So I'm optimistic. I'm actually, I think more like Bill Gates or, or uh, Mark Zuckerberg than Elon Musk. So, I, I, I just want to say for the, I, I disagree I'm going with to my to... friend here. Uh -huh. I think, I think it, AI is not the industrial revolution. And as you understand that very well because you work in that industry, but I, I can say, the speed of evolution that we're going through in AI far exceeds anything that we've done before. And, and from experience in our lifetime, the way regulators move is very much slower than the way technology is evolving. And I'm talking about now. I mean, the, to me, the subtext is if you have a machine that is able to create a body of knowledge or expertise that has not been done before, that is very dangerous. And I'm not saying to kill it, hey, I mean, we're all for innovation, and this is something that we should do. I think just the discussion of regulating and policy need to be uh, 
need to go at the same pace like, uh, like others. I'm going like to technology. have to wrap it up here, but I think the takeaways are the cat's out of the bag. There is an urgent need for discussion, but it's not all bad. This is a wonderful, positive opportunity for humanity. Uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. I'm sorry we didn't have time for more questions because I know there are so many questions um, to ask. This is the beginning of a long and fascinating discussion, which I think we're all looking forward to continuing. In the meantime, I'm going to bring this session to an end and ask you all to please join me in thanking our wonderful panel in the traditional way. Thank you. Thank you very much for this lovely panel. So you know their faces. If you still have questions, you can go for them during lunch break. It's one hour. 120, uh, so it's one hour. Sorry, I thought that this one was working. So you know their faces. If you still have questions, you can go and bother them during the lunch. Enjoy your lunch. Let's reconvene back again here in this room. We have one hour uh, and a half of half an hour speech and then the panel. Back again here at 1.30, please. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.